All right. Well, how about that? Oh, my gosh. That was, uh, how many of you got a chance to participate in that this past week? That was just an unbelievable experience. And I want to just uh, brag, I'm going to brag on our church for just a few moments. When we reached out to that organization and told them what we intended to do and we wanted them to come and get, get uh, us in their schedule, they told us, uh, originally they told us no because they said there's no way you could pull off an event of that scale uh, uh, and be successful at it. And I said, you just have not met our church. <laughs> and so, uh, you, you know, they came and we did all of that. We did almost 43,000 meals in less than two hours. And uh, yeah. They said, uh, we said, um, they said, you have broken all of our actuarial tables to do that so quick. I said, we're all on ADHD meds around here. <laughs> and so we knocked that out really quick. And I want to make sure everybody knows your generosity. We fully funded that event, paid in cash, by the way. So praise the Lord for that. Yeah. So I want to welcome everybody who's here. Certainly want to welcome those who are following online. I want you to reach in your Connect folder and grab your message notes and we're going to dive right in. I've got a lot of content that we're going to uh, push our way through this morning. And we're beginning a new series. We're calling it Better Wise Up. Say that with me. Yeah. Better Wise Up. And I want to begin a conversation with you about wisdom and about growing in wisdom. I don't know if you figured this out yet or noticed this trending in our culture. But wisdom in our culture today seems to be in short supply. Anybody notice that? Anybody picking up on that? And I thought, my gosh, this might be a good idea for us to talk about wisdom a little bit. And so we're going to begin in this series. I'm really, really excited about the content that we're going to do. So what we're going to do today is I want to set up, I want to get everybody sort of on the same plane, if you will, thinking together. And then toward the end of this uh, message today, I want to dive right into a passage of Scripture. But before I want to give a lot of context and sort of bring us all up to date so that when we're working on this stuff uh, in the future, we can work on it together. Because here's the thing I want to give everybody uh, a heads up on. I've got a challenge for you and an assignment I'm going to give you today. All right, everybody good with that if you're visiting our church for the first time you're going a church with homework I'm never coming back you will like it I promise and so that's what we're going to do so we're going to learn how to grow in wisdom I was thinking about this because uh, when you consider the older testament and the new testament when you reach down into the old testament which is where most of us are unfamiliar uh, in terms of our bible reading or or our study there are some books in the Bible in the Older Testament that are oftentimes referred to by scholars as wisdom literature. Sometimes they're, they're lumped together, certain books in the Bible, and they're referred to as wisdom literature. I want you to write that down. You can impress all your friends later on at breakfast or lunch with that. I want to give you the books that are commonly referred to as wisdom literature. They are the book of Proverbs the book of Ecclesiastes, and for many of us who've just been reading in our Bible reading plan here at Community of Hope, uh, they are, it, it is the book of Job. Now sometimes, some, some portions of the Psalms, and sometimes the uh, Song of Solomon will also be referred to as wisdom literature, but primarily the three books that I've just given you. And they're called wisdom literature for this purpose. I want everybody to understand the purpose is to inform the reader how to do well at life, how to live a life that is honorable, a life that is meaningful, and a life that brings honor to the God that we're here this morning to worship. Now, what I believe with all of my heart is that most of us who are here, we have aspirations toward those three things. Honestly, if you were to peel back, you know, and, and, and peek into the heart of most human beings, I believe we all have those aspirations. We don't intentionally set out to be a toxic person, to be a damaging person, to be a mean-spirited person. We may get to that place, but I don't think many of us set out with the intention to take that kind of a journey. Instead, we want to live lives that are honorable. When we get to the end of our lives, we want, to, we want to see honor when we look backwards. We want to see meaning and purpose. We don't want to go, my gosh, I've wasted my life, and I feel good about that, by the way. And we don't want to be in a place where I think many of us want to live in some sense of bringing honor 
to God. Those are great aspirations. And so now these books are books that really train us and talk to us about that. And so we're going to begin and work our way through some of this material. Now, here's a, a personal idea, personal thought. Uh, when I became a, a, a serious Christ follower in 1978, I think I was 16 or 17 years old, and I had an encounter with Jesus Christ that, quite honestly, you hear me refer to every now and again, that transformed my life. I felt like in some ways my life was going in this direction. I met Jesus Christ, and my life began to go in a much healthier, much better uh, direction. And I got associated not only with a church, but with a pastor who saw something in me. It's obvious. It's clear. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he saw something in me, and he took me under his wing, and he began to mentor me. And I think what he saw in me was my tendency toward another concept we're going to talk about in a little bit, and I'll, I'll point it out to you. But anyhow, I began to meet with him, and this is what he said to me. He said, you're at the very beginning of your walk with Christ. And he said, I want to challenge you right at the beginning to begin to develop a habit of reading God's word and applying it to your life. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'd gone to church my whole life. Nobody had ever told me that. And I was just crazy enough as a 16-year-old to take this man's uh, advice. Uh, he was a man who had had a wonderful career as a law enforcement officer. God had called him into the ministry, transformed his, his life. He was having a huge impact on people. And I was just drawn to this man and the way he was living his life. So I took his advice. And I'll never forget, he shared with me a couple of verses that I want to give to you as we begin this morning that are really going to frame out everything that I want to say in these coming weeks together. The first verse he shared with me was a verse in the book of 2 Timothy in the New Testament, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It's a great verse to come into memory. Here it is. He's, it says this, All Scripture is God-breathed is God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good, good work. Here's what my friend said to me. He said, when you read the Bible, you are reading a book that makes a claim of itself that no other book uh, makes that claim. It is a book that, uh, in the way that it is put together, it is God-breathed. It has God's activity on that book. And when you read it, it will begin to challenge you in ways that you didn't even think you were aware of. In fact, I had a friend years later who said it this way, and I've never forgotten. He said, he, he said, I find when I read the Bible that I am not so much reading the Bible, but the Bible is reading me. And many of us have some experience with that. My friend went on to tell me um, this scripture right here, which is in the Old Testament. It's Psalm uh, 119, 105. He says, never forget this. Your, uh, your word, O oh God, is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Anybody ever lose your way? Come on, get your hands up. You're in church, don't lie. Okay, right? We lose our way. And so here is God making a claim on his word, saying, you read, you read my word, you will have a less of a tendency to lose your way. All right, so I, was, uh, I, I took his advice, and I began to read it. Every now and again, in fact, I'll bring... My, my first Bible that I got when I was a follower of Christ, and I show you guys, it's like, it's yellowed everywhere, highlighted everything. Everything was a new concept to me, so it was all brand new, and I just lit on fire with it. And uh, I, at the same time I was doing that, I was challenged by another friend to listen to Christian music and to learn what it is, like what Billy was saying earlier, to sing and to worship God. That was kind of a new concept for me, just going to admit that uh, in the room. And because until this time, I had only primarily listened to the Eagles and Leonard Skinner. I just want to say. I still listen to the Eagles and Leonard Skinner, but I listen to other stuff too. And back then, if you go far enough back into Christian music, to be honest with you, it wasn't great. I just need to admit that. But I started listening to Christian music, and I started listening to a, a, a woman by the name of Amy Grant. I'm being very confessional this morning. And I want to tell everybody in this room, make a confession. I had both this album and this cassette of this, uh, of this uh, set of music. And if you don't know what an album or a cassette is, <laughs> you can ask somebody and they'll tell you. 
And, uh, and so uh, she sings a song on this album entitled Better Wise Up. You following me? And there's a line in the hymn, and, and in fact, in this song, in fact, for a while, um, I had, this was actually, Amy Grant was my first crush, I just want to admit. Uh, in the room, and uh, then I met Beth, and it was Amy Grant, Shmamie Grant. I didn't care about her anymore. <laughs> but uh, there's a line in the hymn, in one of her songs, the song Better Wise Up, and this is the thing that made an impression on me. She says, you've got to use your head to guard your heart. And it made an impression on me. So I want you to understand, you go back far enough into my history, and you find I was developing a habit of reading God's Word, and I was listening occasionally to Christian music, and I, would, I was connecting these lines, and it challenged me. And so uh, this is where, really, this series is coming out of that kind of idea. Because I don't know if you've noticed, like I said earlier, wisdom, I think, is in short supply in our culture. It's eroding. It's erasing. Uh, we, we have phrases for it in our culture. We'll, we'll talk about somebody who is very book smart, and they're not very wise. You know anybody like that? Don't point at your neighbor, right? We know what that's like. We'll, we'll say things like this. We have phrases. We'll say, that person, they're, they're, they're penny wise and what? Pound foolish. See, there's a difference. And some of us have tremendous intellect and we have tremendous book smarts. But here's what I want to tell you, what you already know about yourself. You're not very wise, now, in the Bible, uh, in wisdom literature, it talks about wisdom. Say the word with me, wisdom. And the Hebrew word that is often used to describe the wisdom that we're going to be going at in this series is the word chokmah. And the word chokmah, of which the original Hebrew writers talked about wisdom, communicates the idea of strength and firmness and skill. This is the idea. In other words, this. We develop, if you will, a sense of proficiency about life. You ever, you ever notice somebody and, they, and the way they live their life, it just seems to be clicking on all cylinders. And here's the thing. I'm not saying that everything is successful. That's not a true picture of life. There are hardships. There are difficulties. There are tragedies. There are brokennesses. But even in the midst of all that, I find that some people are able to navigate that far better than others. And they navigate that in a way as it doesn't have to be a destructive force. It doesn't destroy them. They develop an inner resilience. And they push through it. Because they're wise. And, now, and, and that's what the Bible is talking about in this idea. In fact, uh, one pastor that I'm familiar with, David Jeremiah... He says this, he says, skill is what separates success from failure, excellence from mediocrity, and renown from anonymity. It'll turn chaos into order and confusion and direction. And skill is what everyone secretly wants but does not have an equal supply. And skill or wisdom, as the Hebrew word is translated, is the over overarching theme of the book of Proverbs, wisdom literature in the Old Testament. He goes on to say, somewhere between Solomon's day and the present, knowledge, watch this, has become separated from wisdom, especially in the modern West, while the contemporary emphasis is often on knowledge alone to the exclusion of wisdom, chokma, to the ancient Near East upheld the importance of wisdom of how to live well in the world we find ourselves in. Now, knowledge was not devalued. Rather, it was regarded as a means to an end. The end was wisdom, where knowledge and discernment and understanding all combined to produce a positive outcome. And this is the kind of thing I want us to talk about. Now, it's sort of interesting. I want everybody to take note. So we have wisdom, and that's what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to give you the challenge here in just a second. Now, the opposite of wisdom in the Bible is another word we're familiar with, and it's the word folly. Say that with me. Folly. And the definition of folly actually uh, defines itself this way. It means to live impulsively and without discipline. It's the opposite. And when I go back and I talk about my friend and he saw something in me, <laughs> what do you think he saw in me? Probably wasn't wisdom. It was impulsivity. And he knew that left to my own devices, I, I had great potential. 
to drive right off the road. Right? You ever see anybody do that? They had folly. And, and it's sort of an interesting thing. We sing a song around here. Billy was talking about hymns. We sing one hymn around here that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Anybody identify? There it is. And so oftentimes in wisdom literature, you see, a, you, you see an interplay, a, 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 uh, a, an opposite attraction relationship between the idea of developing wisdom which we're going to talk about, as opposed to living undisciplined, unbridled lives filled with folly. And by the way, our lives have a way of adding up if you haven't figured that out. There's another strong operational principle in the scripture which Jesus reminded many people of, which says this, whatever you sow, you will what? Reap. So you sow a lot of folly, you reap a lot of the consequences related to folly. You sow wisdom, and you just by nature reap the benefits of wisdom. And so what I want to talk to us about in this series is this. I want to teach you how to grow in wisdom and how to fall in love with wisdom and to crave it for your life. Because many of us are in situations where our lives literally hang in the balance of this decision. So here's the thing, choose well. So now let me just give you, before I go on, let me give you the, the assignment, the challenge, okay? So the assignment, the challenge is, if you look at the book of Proverbs, there, there are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, so my friend told me years ago, he said, you could read a chapter of the book of Proverbs every day and you get to the end of the month, you could just literally start over and do that again. And that's the challenge. So uh, in this series, here's what we're going to do. Beginning today, we're all going to read Proverbs 1. And I want to remind you, how many of you are willing to do that? Read Proverbs 1. Great. Now, hold your hand up. I want to remind everybody, God is watching you right now. <laughs> So you just said that in his house. So today you're going to read Proverbs 1. Tomorrow you're going to read Proverbs 2. And we're going to go through and we're going to read all 31 Proverbs in these next days. And then here's what Tr Pastor Trevor and I are going to do. Every seven days, we're going to choose a proverb, a few verses, out of that seven days reading. And we're going to preach to you from it. So we're going to take one passage within that scope of that week. And we're going to do a deeper dive into that. All right? That's our challenge. That's what we're going to do. Everybody in? Ready? Hands out. Three, two, one, go team. All right, message isn't over. I just wanted to do that. All right, now, I think um, all of that really begins well, uh, and we're going to start right in Proverbs chapter 1. And I want to read to you the first seven verses of Proverbs chapter 1. Here it is. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Watch this. For gaining wisdom and instruction. For understanding words of insight. For receiving instruction in prudent behavior. For doing what is right and just and fair. For giving prudence to those who are simple. Knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. And then here's the verse right here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now I want us to look at that list just uh, for a few moments there and I want to, uh, you to notice and see if you are drawn to any of that like I am. Uh, maybe we would do this also by a show of hands. How many of you would say you could stand to gain some wisdom and instruction for your own life? Okay, hands down. Here's another one. How many of you would like to gain some uh, understanding concerning words of insight? How about receiving instruction in prudent behavior? How about learning how to better do what is right and just and fair? All right? 
How about giving prudence to those who are simple? And the idea behind that is for those who are prone to folly. Oh, man. All right. I mean, I think more hands should go up probably. No, no. Okay, just saying. I, I know some of you all really well. All right. Uh, here's one. How about many of you would uh, be able to know, like to know how to better give knowledge and discretion to the young? Come on. See, it's all of us. And, uh, and so uh, what I want to do now, is, since we're all on the same page, I want to use the remaining time, and I just want to shift over to this, this, this verse 7. That I think is very powerful. I want to make sure I want to clear up a misconception. Uh, the first time I ever read this, uh, when, when my friend had challenged me to read God's Word, and I got to Proverbs 1-7, I was struck by it, but not in a good way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And I was, I was concerned by that. Because I was trying real hard. I had, I had some people in my past that walked with God in a way that was scary to me. Can I just admit that? And um, I didn't find them even kind people. Can I admit that? And so when I read that, it triggered for me a lot of those feelings. And I thought, wait a minute, hold on. I've just learned about this God in heaven who loves me unconditionally, and now I'm supposed to fear him. And I took a step back from that. And what I was later to learn was simply this, and I'm always a little nervous to share this, so let me, let me vet this out, make sure we all understand it. Uh, I am challenging everyone to get into God's word, and yet I'm always, I'm always a little intimidated or afraid whenever I have to say something as a pastor uh, and, 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 and call back upon my education or my study because I don't want anybody in the room to go, oh, wait a minute, I've not had that education, so then the Bible's not for me. That's not true. But I do want to clear up one misconception here. Sometimes in the original languages, in Hebrew and in Greek, we simply do not have English words that do justice to a word that would translate into our English language. This is a perfect example. Because the word that is used here that talks about fear is actually a word, year ah, which translates this, to have deep respect for God. And the closest the translators could get is this word that we would say in our English language, fear. But it doesn't mean fear in the rational sense we're talking about. It means to develop, the, the, the person who develops a deep respect for God. That is the beginning of knowledge right there. It, it's learning to acknowledge that God's word and God's way is the biggest word in the room. When Beth and I were, were, were planting Community of Hope Church and it's starting in our living room over in Lake Worth in a rental house, and we were saying, what kind of church do we really aspire Community of Hope to be? We said we want it to be a church that's, that is focused foundationally upon the explanation and the clear teaching of God's word. But we, and we wanted it to be a place where people can come in and wrestle with these kinds of ideas. But we wanted it to be a place where people knew that God loved them. This is at play in here. So the word translates deep respect. Now, there's another. Here's an interesting thing. You can go to the New Testament, and you can find in the New Testament uh, another verse that kind of communicates this idea. In fact, we sang about it a little this morning, and I think it'll get us a little further down the road. It's a verse we normally think about at Christmas time, but I want to show it to you. It's John chapter 1, verse 14, and it says this. It says, the word became flesh. Who, who, who's John writing about here? Jesus. Watch this. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have, look at this. We have seen his glory. There's the respect. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father. Now it says this, full of grace and full of truth. So here's what I want to say. When you think about the fear of the Lord, the respect of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Here's the picture I want everybody to get. I want you to get in your head the picture of Jesus. That's the picture I want you to get, even down into the Old Testament. The fear of the Lord, the respect of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We get a picture of Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus showed up on the scene. Irreligious people, people far from God, people who had a lot of shame were just drawn to him because of his love. And yet he spoke truth to them in a way that helped their lives and provided them wisdom. 
Now, I was thinking about this concept. Now, I hope this makes sense. So the Bible says this. The Bible says that Jesus is full of grace. So if we were to let this be grace, and we were pouring this in and saying, this is Jesus, and he's full of grace. Every one of us love grace. We need grace. And if you don't know what grace is, you can write this down. Grace is this. Grace is unmerited favor. It's, it's to receive what you don't deserve. You ever been graced something? Uh, one of the things my wife and I like to do, I don't talk about this, but we like to do every now and again, we will, when we're out at dinner, we'll pick a couple and we'll pay for their meal just to do it. You ever had someone pay for your meal at dinner? You go to get the check and they go, oh, it's been taken care of. That's a grace, right? And we need grace in our lives. We have things for which we have shame over. And we need help. And we fall short. We need grace. The Bible says that Jesus was 100% grace. But here's what I found out about grace. Grace, not properly mixed with anything else, very quickly can become cheap. It's very cheap in our culture. And so grace, without any counterbalance or counterweight to it, just we begin to take it for granted. Uh, we live in a nation, and we know that people uh, have paid great sacrifices for the nation, and we, live, we don't even think about that anymore. Take for granted. We have uh, folks that put their life in the line for us every day. I don't even think about them. Take for granted. A lot of that stuff is going on. And when we just receive grace upon grace upon grace, but we're not, uh, there's no counterbalance to it, it's cheap. And so some of us have been given grace, and it's really not done anything for us in our lives because it's just become cheap to us. We should be careful about that. Now, here's the other thing. The Bible says that Jesus, though, he wasn't just 100% grace, full of grace. He was also full of what? Truth. And we need truth, too, because we are prone to folly. We are prone to not go the right way. We have a tendency, a predisposition to choose not what is right but, and what is best and what is honorable and what is meaningful and what brings glory to God. We, we have a tendency to choose what's not good, and we need, we need truth. But I want to say as well, if all you receive is truth, we struggle under the weight of that. You ever had somebody in your life that said, well, I'm just to you, I'm just a truth teller. And all they ever do is tell you truth. I've had people in our church that are like that to me. And I got to tell you, I duck them at the grocery store. Okay? We just can't have all truth all the time. And if we're going to have truth... We need truth that is seasoned with grace. And when we pursue a God and we give reverence and honor to a God that has revealed himself in grace and in truth, here's the natural equal of that uh, experience. It is wisdom. Some of us are in situations right now, and here's what we need. We need grace. I am struggling here. And that's not the moment we need a truth teller to come beat us up with truth. But if we're not careful in our lives, we'll live with cheap grace and ignore that we need someone wiser than us to tell us what everyone else is afraid to tell us. And that's what the spirit of the living God will do if you'll let him. Okay? So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I hope from now on, whenever you see that verse, 
you will think of the presence and the person of Jesus, but you'll remember that Jesus is full of grace and full of truth. And you need both in equal supply. Now, over the series, I'm, and I'm going to close, but over the series, I want to tell you, we're going to, you got to bring three things to the series. This is what Trevor and I are going to bring, and we're going to challenge you with the word, but, but I want you to bring something when you come in here. Here are the three things I want you to bring with you. I want you to bring, first of all, I want you to bring an openness that you would open your mind and your heart to God. Some of you may be here and you go, I'm not even sure God exists. Would you just become willing and say, maybe I'm wrong. So I'm just going to be open. Come and see what happens in the next 30 days. Secondly, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do this. I want you to admit that your wisdom has its own limitations. Okay? That when we especially gather in this place, there's someone in this room smarter than you, and it ain't me. It's the Spirit of Jesus in this room. And then over the next 30 days, here's what we're going to do. This is cool. We're going to learn to apply God's word to folly-prone areas of our life. Got any? Got any? Okay. If you'll do that, I promise you at the end of 30 days, you're going to be wiser than when you started. Some of you, I'm looking at you right now, you look a little wiser right now. Honestly. Okay. All right. All right, we have a custom here that we always close down a little early because we literally believe the Holy Spirit is here speaking and we want to give reverence and attention to him. So our team's going to come out. We're going to have a song. We'll open the altar. Maybe some of us want to come and just bow a knee, bow right there in your seat, do whatever you need to do, and say, God, I, I, I need truth. I need grace. You tell him what you, what you feel he's saying to you. All right, let's pray. Lord, would you use this morning in important ways in our lives? Some of us are here, we're hurting, we're broken, we're confused, we're angry. We're... Some of us are here, we're doing well, things are great. We've been encouraged and we just, we just want to grow even more. Wherever we find ourselves on that pendulum today, Jesus, use these final moments to speak your wonderful words of grace and truth to us. Because we know, Lord, the respect, the awe of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge that leads to wisdom. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come as you feel that.